Okay, well, welcome everyone to, to virtual Protopia Chicago. Um, I, I've got to say, I've got really mixed feelings about this because I love go to Chicago and I'm really sad that I'm not actually in Chicago. So, so there's that. I've been to several go to Chicago's. Good morning, good virtual morning. Uh, if you're in Chicago, uh, good late afternoon if you're in the UK. Um, so, yes, I'm Daniel Terhorse North. Um, I've been causing mischief in the software world for about 30 years. And uh, in the last probably 10 or so of those, really looking at scaling, how, how, how to get delivery working at scale in organizations. Um, and along the way, about five years ago, maybe more, um, I met the uh, amazing Anna Urbaniak uh, working at a client and, and uh, discovered just when you meet someone who's just like way smarter than you and you want to spend time with them. So, so that's how Anna, Anna and I uh, met. So Anna, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome. So my name is Anna Urbaniak. I have started my career over 10 years ago in project and program management and very quickly moved over to introducing and facilitating change in organization. And as Daniel said, this is how, we, how we've how we met and started hanging out. And then for the last few years, we actually created a really effective team working together. So that's me. So, and uh, this morning then we want to talk about um, agility at scale, uh, a meeting of mindsets. Uh, and the idea is that we have uh, two, what, what we think of as conflicting mindsets and what we've realized is they work very well together. Um, so this is a talk in two parts. So in the first part, we want to introduce um, uh, the two mindsets. And the second part, we want to look at how we, how, how we create that synthesis. So in order to do that, we're going to need some help. So we're talking about the digital mindset and the, the, the digital product mindset and the industrial mindset. What do we mean by those? Well, in order to introduce those, uh, I'm going to need some help. Um, so I want Martha Lane Fox. Um, some of you will know Martha Lane Fox. Dame Martha Lane Fox uh, was the founder of lastminute.com, which is one of the real success stories of the first dot-com bubble in the UK. And what was really interesting about her, her setup was that it was as much a commercial play as a digital one, as a product one. So she, she, um, she built a, a business model selling effectively expiring goods. So things like uh, concert tickets, uh, restaurant um, reservations, events, that kind of thing. And once she launched, the model's easy. Anyone can copy the model, but unfortunately, she'd already sewn up the market. So it was a brilliant commercial play as well as a digital play. She then went on to advise UK government on digital policy. And so she's one of my kind of uh, model, if you like, um, digital product thinking folks. Um, in, the, in the red corner, we have uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, one of the great industrialists, built uh, railways, canals, uh, ships, uh, bridges, a very, very, very famous Victorian engineer. So... That, so uh, Anna will take the part of Martha Lane Fox and I will be Isambard Kingdom Brunel. So here we go. So um, we recognize that the world is quite uncertain, so there's a high uncertainty, and therefore in order to meet the customer needs, we really need to maximize learning. So we really need to understand how the world is changing, how is our context changing, and what can we do about it? And of course, I think this is completely uh, nonsense, preposterous. Uh, everything's well understood. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, we have low uncertainty, <clears throat> so so this this need for learning seems to be it seems to be a waste of time to me. Why the waste of time for us is because uh, we actually measure the results by the impact we made on the customer. So we recognize that the more successful we can make the customer, the more successful we can be. So that uncertainty and really looking out of what's going on and how the customer needs are changing, it's very important in order for us to be able to make an impact on them. Um, we well, see, that's not how I measure results. I measure results by output. More railways are better, more canals is better, bigger bridges is better. So, so really, I want people to be busy and I want work to be happening. So, okay, let's take a look about how you're structured then. So we structured around um, the product. 
So we ensure that our teams have all the skills they actually need to deliver that impact on the customer. And in order to do that very effectively, we recognize that it's important to have a general knowledge of what everyone in the team is doing before we can develop the empathy and better understanding how what we do play a role in the larger part of delivering those results. So as, a, as a Victorian industrialist, I don't know what this word empathy means. What I do know is that if we organize by function, uh, then, then things will be more efficient. And so therefore I reward specialists and the deeper your knowledge in a particular area, then, then the more successful you're going to be in my organizations. And, and finally, then let's take a look at what the purpose is. What's the goal of your operation? What are you trying to do? So in the digital product mindset, we're trying to maximize the discovery. So the products are changing, the digitalization is changing the world at much faster rate than ever before. And therefore, the only way to achieve that is through the experimentation. So we sense, we respond, we try an error, and that way we learn to make sure that we know more and more about what is actually happening around us. And again, this is discovery. Discovery sounds like surprises to me. And, and as a bridge builder, I don't like surprises. So, so I'm, I'm more about um, minimizing variance. And I minimize variance through strict controls. Uh, so, and, 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 and so you can see, okay, up to here, you can kind of see that these folks might, you know, disagree and move on or something. But when you start looking at the goal of their various operations, these are diametrically opposed. Maximizing discovery and minimizing variance are completely at odds with each other. And we see this, we see this in the workplace. We see these industrial habits, these traditional industrial habits clashing with this digital product principles. So from that, let's take a look. This is a list of principles from GDS, which is the UK Government Digital Services Group that was set up in around 2012. Um, which was a response to some really disastrous UK uh, government IT projects, massive programs, billions of pounds burnt, uh, practically zero results. And so Martha Lane Fox was one of the people who uh, created the uh, Government Digital Service. And, and they're, they're a really interesting organization. They've done some really great stuff. And one of the things they did was they, they looked at governance and they said, how does governance work in a digital product organization and in a digital product construct? And they came up with effectively six principles. So their six principles are this, don't slow down delivery. Okay. So whatever you're trying to do, you know, any gates, anything sitting in the way that slow down delivery, we want to eliminate those. We want to move decisions to where they're needed and when they're needed and at the right level. So we want to delegate decision-making. We want to do this with the right people. So to make sure we've got the right people in the mix rather than um, keeping people at arm's length. Uh, go and see for yourself is one of their key, um, their key, key tenets. In the, in the main uh, office building they were in, in in central London, they had a, it was wonderful, they had a big sheet of butcher's paper uh, stuck in the window and there was a cutout in it. And the cutout, you could look through the cutout down onto a London street and there was a coffee shop on the corner and people coming out of the underground station and whatever. And there was a big arrow on the sheet of paper that said your customers, right? And so you look through the window and you see, you know, human beings in London doing stuff. But go see for yourself. Only do it if it adds value. So all of the kind of ceremony and, and traditional things that we do, they said, we don't need any of that. Do it if it adds value. And, and the last thing, which was anathema to, to um, the, the UK public sector, is trust and verify. So in other words, assume people have best intent and then, and, then, and then kind of check on them in order to help them. And so our industrial processes are largely uh, uh, misaligned with this. So we're talking about don't slow down delivery. In most organizations, most digital organizations, we've got this huge complex release coordination. We have CAB, the Change Advisory Board. It's not an advisory board. It's an approval board. And they're acting as a gatekeeper. We have big upfront technical and visual design work. And we have work breakdown into, into what, you know, we, we don't call it a Gantt chart. We call it a backlog, but basically it's a Gantt chart turned 90 degrees. Um, do it with the right people? Not really. So any specialist activity, the work goes out of the team. We wait for people and then it comes back into the team. And, and so again, this is directly opposed to, to doing it with the right people. We don't go and see for ourselves. We have a separation of business and IT. And often we have business and change in IT or business and change in IT and operations. You know, you get these massive chains of, 
of silos of people. Um, doing it if it adds value. We're, we're culturally kind of discouraged from questioning the process. We do the process. This is what we've always done. Um, and then and finally, we don't trust and verify. Anytime something goes wrong, we introduce more process. You know, you see, you see more and more layers of, uh, Dave Thomas calls it organizational scar tissue, which is, which is a, a lovely metaphor. So, so, and this is most people, and I'll be honest, this is my um, assumption about industrial thinking versus digital product thinking for many years. And then what Anna and I have realized, have observed over the last few years is, is it doesn't need to be like that. So we really, really uh, discovered that agility at scale requires both mindsets. In, in the space of ownership, it really requires the teams to carry the pages. So the product teams need to run what they're building to take the full ownership of it. However, it also requires from yeah. the ownership perspective. So yeah, so what you need as well is, is to commoditize this, is to have uh, the runtime, the runtime environment, the operability, that to, to view that as a product as well. So now if you have the runtime, the, the build and run infrastructure uh, as, as a product, and you think of your product teams as the customers of that product, this is how you can then scale using that industrial thinking. And from the agency perspective, so what those teams really can do, we require the teams to be empowered, to be able to adopt the local conditions, because only by being closest to the information that impact our, impacting our customer and adapting to that information, we can help that customer to be successful. And, and again, you know, people are busy, right? So people in teams are doing work. And so... What do we do? What we want from a, from a scaling perspective is to, I call it harvesting and amplifying. So you want folks who are going from team to team, looking at what's good and saying, well, I'm going to make that famous. And so they do the work of taking in, someone's done some really brilliant infrastructure work or uh, interop work. We say, right, well, I'm going to turn that into a library. We're going to have some documentation around that. We're going to make it uh, robust. We're going to start scaling it across teams and make it available as an internal capability. The harvesting and amplifying and, and th this flies in the face of the typical kind of uh, architecture teams, if you like, who kind of sit in a little huddle and, and emit stuff, right? So the kind of the, 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 the enterprise architecture folks in a, in a high functioning organization like this, they are out and about because they assume that other people have the answers and their job is to figure out, is to find those people, bring that work in and then say, right, this is amazing. We're going to make it so that everyone has access to this. And when we look at the governance, we really need to trust the teams. We need the, the teams to be treated as a responsible owners, the owners that track their own progress and report it against the goals that they have been, they have taken on. And again, so from, a, <clears throat> from the industrial perspective, what we have from a leadership level is defining overall expectations. So a uh, real example, Anna and I are working in an organization with several hundred people spread across like tens of teams. And, and all we said to them is this, we said we want to measure lead time, we want to measure throughput, we want to measure load, like work in process. Now, how you choose to work as a team is entirely up to you, right? As long as on every couple of weeks or so, you can tell us roughly how long a piece of work takes, once we drop it in the hopper, how long till it's available. We want, to, you, want, we want you to be able to tell us roughly how, much, how many things are in flight at any point in time. And, and roughly how many things you're shipping. And obviously from team to team, the definition of a thing is enormously variable. What it means though, is that all of the teams are using similar metrics and similar tooling to think about how they do work. So the leadership defines that, but it's entirely up to the teams how they implement that. So through our work, we really find out that looking at those two mindsets is a structured formulation of what Spotify meant by autonomy with alignment. And this is what we have been exploring with our, and iterating on with our clients in the last few years. And we would like to dive in a little bit more with you to find out what exactly it means. So we start with alignment. So what alignment is, alignment is being in line or in agreement with others. And uh, when we think about alignment, we say alignment of what? 
So we look at the alignment of product vision, technology vision, approach and focus. And what does it mean? It means that anyone within the organization is able to answer the questions. What are we building and why? Where are we going? How are we working? What is the path to production process? How do I get something uh, procured, approved? What is the thing we're going to be working on next? So we know which skills to learn, etc. So that is the alignment of those four things that really needs to be in place. And who owns this alignment? So this alignment is owned by different layers of leadership, not necessarily layers, but different dimensions of leadership. The product leadership, technology, practice leadership, and here we mean both practices and guilds that are actually treated as a first class uh, contracts, as well as deliver leadership. So when we think about those leaderships, it's important to emphasize that the leadership is cross-cutting across the whole of the organization. We're not talking about independent product leadership for this particular product in this particular department, completely not connected to everything else that the organization is doing. We're talking about fully transparent collaborative leadership that is aligned across all the different elements of that organization. And what the role is, the role really is to take on and share that vision through the rest of the organization. So it means that communicating that vision through product strategy, technology strategy, the way we work, um, and also through clearly defined OKRs that cascade down the organization. And those OKRs don't only define the objectives and key results for the product, but also for all the other strategies listed above, and they cascade down through the teams. So in summary, in order to have an alignment across the organization, we need a long lasting structure. We need all of those leadership organizations and groups to provide, um, to provide direction that is adaptive to the way that the world is changing. And only through that, we can then move to the discovering autonomy. Because once we have that, uh, that alignment in place, we can then look at autonomy and then understand a little bit better what role does autonomy play in the successful execution of that vision and strategy. So autonomy requires six things, and we're going to go through those together now. So what we discovered is the first thing we need in order for autonomy to, autonomy to be effectively in place in the organization is an objective. And by objective, we mean a very clear purpose in terms of what are we trying to achieve and for whom. We also require um, constraints. And the constraints is basically like the rules of the road. And those constraints come in two forms. They come in the form of governing constraints as well as enabling constraints. The governing constraints are the ones that told us what to do and what not to do. And the enabling ones are the ones that allow us to do better, to do more, to be more creative, to explore and learn. Then we also need accountability. And that accountability in terms of what? So uh, are we doing the right thing? As well as how? So are we doing it in the right way? And those three um, elements that we see actually stay on the or form a demand side of the organization. And on the other hand, we've got capability. So capability is really thinking beyond the skills. Normally, when we think about capabilities, we think about the skills, maybe experience. But you want to go beyond that and also think about the information and the knowledge, the tacit, the explicit knowledge that we require um, for the particular work project um, or outcome. The next one is resources, and those are both physical as well as digital. So they could be licenses, applications, the, the kind of infrastructure we need in place to be procured for particular um, outcome. And finally is authority. And authority is simple um, permission. So what are we allowed and not allowed to do? And uh, that is something that might need to be earned, especially in the perspective of the new teams. And those three things form the supply side. And the reason why we like thinking about it as a demand side and the supply side is because they are interdependent. 
which if you can imagine, if anything changes on any of those sides, any of those elements, the rest of them will need to be reviewed, just like it is in the complex adaptive system. If all of a sudden objective changes, we might need to review whether we've got the right capabilities, the right resources. All of a sudden, the scope of that objective introducing place where we don't have authority. So all of those things form very interdependent system. Before, we need to really look into like, okay, how do we... How do we manage those? Like, how do we know which ones? What do we do with them in order to um, deliver successful outcomes for the organization? So, as an example, let's look at driving. So, um, a great for me, my, my, my favorite illustration of an autonomous system is cars driving on a road. Okay, so anyone in a car is it has an objective. They, they're, they're either going somewhere. They might just be out for a drive. You know, they might be out because they like driving their car. That's an objective. I'm going to go out and enjoy myself in my car. The constraints there are literally the rules of the road. You know, it doesn't matter which side you drive on, right? As long as we all agree. <laughs> because as soon as we don't all agree, bad things are going to happen. Um, and accountability. There's, uh, Kent Beck has my favorite riff on this. Uh, There's a tweet some years ago. He said, autonomy without accountability is vacation. I think that's wonderful. You know, it, in order to be autonomous, you need, that, then, that you need to be held to it. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean having someone coming after you. This is about holding yourselves to account and, and, and choosing to be responsible. Um, and again, if any of those change, if we decide that we're going to ri drive on the other side of the road or if we're going to go somewhere else, it may be that we need to learn something new. Right? It may be that um, we need some resources that we didn't need before. And it may be that we need permissions that we didn't need before. And, and, and so what got me really excited and the thing, the thing that, I, you know, for me, the crux of this um, talk today and again we could go so deep into all of this but we've got a very limited amount of time um, we will be in slack afterwards is the idea of autonomy liquidity so this is this is this is the reveal okay this is the ta -da. so some years ago i was working with a chap called chris matz um, who coined the term skills liquidity and he was talking about the idea that you can think so liquidity is a financial markets term and what it means is how easy it is to get hold of something so cash is the ultimate liquid thing, right? You can have cash. Uh, shares might be, uh, if, if a company is trying to sell loads of shares, then, then, then they're easy to get hold of, they're illiquid. If everyone's holding on to those shares, they're illiquid. So liquidity is the availability of something in a market. And if Chris is listening to this talk, he will tear that definition to pieces, but it, it's close enough, right? So liquidity is the availability of something. And he said, well, what if you think about skills in that way? So, you know, if I need, say, some Python skills, or I need someone who knows Python, any decent programmer can learn Python pretty quickly in days or weeks, right, in order to get okay at it and get work done. And so that's a relatively liquid skill. I can just go learn that. Um, something like, I don't know, uh, pricing structured derivatives to keep in the financial work, world um, is an incredibly difficult thing to do, and it takes you 10 years to get, like, half decent at it. So, so there, I'm unlikely to read a book on it and become an expert overnight. So what I've done um, with Anna is we've expanded the idea of, of skills liquidity across all of those elements of autonomy. So if you think of each element as an asset, then we've got objectives, constraints, accountability, capability, resources, authority. Each of those is an asset, is a, is a thing that as a team I can have more or less of and need more or less of. And each asset has liquidity. Right? How easy is it to obtain or change that asset, okay, that, 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 that element? And so then I can ask the question, uh, uh, what should I do if I need some of that thing based on its liquidity? And liquidity is a function of time, right? So it may be, and back to Anna's earlier observation, that things like um, authority need to be earned. Right? Now, the first time I try to do something, I might need to get a responsible adult to do it for me. But then after I've been through that with them a few times, they know that I sort of know what I'm doing and they might just let me do it myself. And after a while, once I've demonstrated that I can deploy to production without blowing things up, um, that I can maybe make some config changes without blowing things up, that, and, and then I start to get a reputation as being reasonably trustworthy, or my team does, then we're more likely to be able to, to, to get other authority to do other things. So authority becomes a more liquid uh, element for us. And so what we can do is this. We can say, if that asset is easy to obtain, let's just go get it. 
right? If it's licenses for something and they're easy to obtain, let's just go get them. If it's a particular set of skills, let's just go learn them, okay? Um, otherwise, right, if it's harder to obtain, then, then learning them ourselves, skilling ourselves up is going to take time. So maybe we can try and borrow some. That could be um, in the context of bringing in some consultants or bringing in some external folks or maybe seconding someone from another team for a while or you or get getting someone to lend us their access to make a, a change in the firewall or something. And then finally, if it's impossible, if we can't obtain that for now, if it's an illiquid asset, then what are we going to do? Well, we need to find another way for now. Right? And maybe that we don't have permission to do this thing for now. So what's the workaround? We know later on, once we earn that permission, we can go back and take a look at that. But right now we need to do a different thing. And when we start thinking of the various elements of autonomy as assets with varying liquidity, suddenly the way we think about this stuff really changes. Mm -hmm. So what we realize is we need both autonomy and alignment in order to get work done. Because we can, we, we can kind of prove this, if you like, by exception. We can say, if we have alignment but no autonomy, all we have is autocracy. We're just being told what to do. We're not allowed to have any say in it. A good friend of mine says, tell me what you want or tell me how, but don't tell me both. I, I quite like that. And the flip side, autonomy without alignment is a bunch of people doing stuff. Okay, It's not going to end well. Again, in the small, it's fine. If you've got a couple of teams, half a dozen teams, they'll be okay. As soon as you have many, 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 many teams, if you don't have that alignment, bad things will happen. A really simple example, let's take a choice of database, right? So a choice of data store. So one team decides they're going to you know, go, uh, go use old school SQL and they're going to get an Oracle database. Maybe someone else is going to use a MySQL database to open source. Um, another team is going to use Cassandra. Someone else is going to use and so on and so on and so on. For each team, that's completely fine. Each team is going to solve its own problem until somewhere downstream where these things need to be deployed, upgraded, secured, uh, um, tuned, monitored, right, repaired, and so on. And, and suddenly you've got this massive combinatorial explosion of complexity, and no one really thought about that. If we can create the alignment and then allow the autonomy through that alignment, then, then, then we're on to a winner. And uh, Henrik Nieberg, um, who's ex-Spotify, he's, he's playing games in Minecraft or something these days, um, draws wonderful pictures. I love this. So this is a little diagram of like high versus low alignment, high versus low autonomy. And basically, you have this, this poor pointy head boss who's trying to make sense of the world. Um, it's fun. So, so, so this is where we're at. Um, what we want to give you, though, is, is, is a takeaway. It's something to get you started. So... So if, if our goal is to achieve those high levels of autonomy and alignment in order to deliver better outcomes and work more effectively as a large organization, it's very important before we get too overwhelmed, there's too much to look at and too many things to think about. Um, it's important to understand where we are, and that's always the starting point. So how aligned our organization is today? And we put together those, those questions for you to kind of really think in those dimensions we discussed earlier for um, alignment as well as autonomy. And, and the questions go along the lines, is, is the strategy well understood for both for a product and technology? And do we see that the teams can effectively share and connect and uh, be aligned on the way they work, what tooling they use, what experience they have, can they learn from each other? Do our OKRs cascade up and down? And how would we rate ourselves or assess ourselves on each of those dimensions of um, autonomy we covered? So uh, we put together a short, you can say survey, so something for us to, or for you to look at and um, assess where, where do you feel you are. And what, what I just want to emphasize, it is very important here to think about this 360 feedback idea. It's not only for the leadership or for the managers to rate themselves, where do I feel, or where do I see my organization is, but it's more important than ever to ask those questions for the people on the ground where actually the action is happening. Because the thing that we've got to remember is that very often what we see is just a presenting symptom of something else. So in here, what is important, just want to share my experience, is, you know, I would work, I've worked with the team. And for example, that team says like, oh, we have a really big resource gap. Like it's, 
it's coming across that like we're really lacking those environments for testing and this is what is causing this quality to look at this and when we started to dive deeper and speak to people on different levels we realized it's like the problem is not the resources the problem is this complete lack of vision and the strategy for where the technology is going therefore people are completely unable to make the right choices or even knowing what they need to do on the other hand, you can also look at the example when we really feel that like, you know what, the problem is our ways of working. We don't know how we should be working. And then what we discover is like, hold on a second, there is a capability gap. The capability gap is uh, where maybe we have too many people that are too junior and they're actually not yet able to do the things that this particular product requires us to be done. It's a little bit like following on Daniel's car analogy. It's a little bit like seeing a smoke coming out of the exhaust and then trying to say, what is actually causing it? Because sticking your hand at the exhaust to stop the smoke coming out is not going to fix the problem. The problem is some pro probably somewhere deeper into the engine bay, etc. So it's in order not to become too overwhelmed with this exercise, I just want to emphasize that one of the most powerful tools we discover in this context, which is the theory of constraint. Once you do this, there will probably going to be about 63 things you can go after. And I just think about what is the one that is the most impeding for your organization, for your teams. Let's understand what is causing that and just address that first. And that way, it's really great focusing tools because it enables us to tackle the organization when we can, um, for the minimum effort, in a way, have the maximum difference for the entire organization. So you really got to think here about all of this being part of the bigger complex system. So the thing that we've been looking at which which we're, we're finding super exciting so we're, we're going out and telling people about it is is the the convergence if you like the idea of overlaying um uh, autonomy liquidity with theory of constraints so we so let's say let's take this this example where we don't have enough environments or environment setup time is too expensive or whatever and we can share okay well that's the presenting symptom right now let's take a look at our various elements of autonomy and let's see which ones of those, which sliders can we shift in a way that's going to be useful to us. And so for instance, uh, and I think probably James Lewis taught me this or we figured it out together or something many years ago, right? Is you can either need more environments or you can change your software so you need fewer environments, you know? And so actually you might find that shifting left on... Uh, architecture, testing, um, confidence in structure, things like you know, building smaller components that are easier to reason about, suddenly require less testing, require fewer environments, require less time in the, in the value chain in order to be confident about what the product is. And so what presents as we don't have enough environments is really we've written software that requires all of this ceremony in order to get it out the door. Let's let, take a look at the code itself. Let's take a look at the architecture that led us to these decisions. So autonomy liquidity coupled with theory of constraints says, focus on the right thing, um, create options in terms of what you can do to address that. Because often it isn't where the symptom is presenting, it's somewhere else in the value chain. So. Let's, uh, let, let, let's sum up then. Um, what we've realized is this, you don't scale Agile, okay? You can't scale Agile. Scaling Agile isn't a thing. Um, anyone who tells you that you can scale Agile is trying to sell you a scaling Agile product. What you can do is enable agility at scale, okay? The way you enable agility at scale is through autonomy with alignment. Um, there's a lovely quote that says, uh, you know, that, that in nature, there are no systems that were complex from the outset. Any complex, any, any big complicated system in nature started as a small system that was successful and then it grew, okay? So we can, we, we can create autonomy with alignment. How do we create alignment? What are, our, what are our rules of nature? What are our physics for this organization? Once we have that, we can start looking at autonomy. And this requires, as we were saying earlier, both industrial and digital product thinking. The digital product thinking will help us iterate and explore and discover and learn. And the industrial thinking will help us Take that, harvest it, amplify it, make it famous, and create that consistency across the organization. And alignment comes through structure and direction. And that structure, as Anna was saying, the structure is long lived, right? I can go into your organization at any time. I should see an absolutely incredible uh, product leadership across the organization. I should see an amazing technical leadership across the organization. 
ThoughtWorks, I was there over or nearly 10 years ago, over 10 years ago now, right? Um, in the decade since I left, I know I can still walk in there and meet a brilliant technology panel because they take that stuff really seriously. Uh, um, uh, direction is going to change. Direction is a function of context. It's a function of market. It's a function of where you want to go in your strategy. And so that should be changing. So the structure is fixed or the structure is long lived. The direction adapts based on what you learn. And the autonomy then comes through managing that, that, that liquidity and understanding what those elements are, how they're interrelated and what levers you've got right now. And, and, and remembering to reassess that liquidity on a regular basis because it's going to change. Um, and that was kind of all we had to say. So I think we've still got a few minutes now for, for questions.